Miss Blair Lee. My, my name is Blair Lee. I am the author of two science courses, Real Science Odyssey Biology 2 and Real Science Odyssey Chemistry 1. They were written primarily, they were written by a homeschooling mom. I've been homeschooling my son for eight years for primarily homeschoolers. Uh, the difference between a homeschool text and a text written for traditional school is that when you write it, you have to assume that the parent might not have a degree in that area or and but that really wants their children to learn science. So I am going to turn the video off because I find it distracting to watch myself. And now we're just going to go to the slides. You can download these slides at the end if you want. So I've homeschooled my son for 14 years. Uh, he's 14 years old for eight years. Um, before I had him, I taught chemistry and biology at community college. And over the 20 plus years that I have been involved in science education, I have thought a lot about how people learn science. And that is going to be a big focus of my talk today. I am a passionate advocate of science, homeschooling, and education. I love the subject I'm talking about today because homeschooling science brings science, homeschooling, and education all into one talk. So I am a passionate advocate for learning science, and there is absolutely no better setting outside of college than a homeschool setting. So how can I say this? There are many people, notable scientists among them, who believe the exact opposite. So of all the academic subjects, science is the one that is the best fit for the homeschooling environment because science is best taught where there is the time and space to ponder, research, explore, and get up and experiment. With the right tools and support, you do not need to have a science degree. All you need is a willingness and desire to have your child learn how the natural and physical world works. So before beginning, I want to clarify some terms I will be using. Uh, I think that I want you to be on the same page with what I'm really talking about. When I talk about science, I am not talking about pointless topics that do not relate to your life. I am talking about a collection of disciplines that together form the academic field that explains how the natural and physical world works. This includes issues relating to your and your family's health. I will refer to science in these terms over this talk to remind you of the relevancy and importance of this academic field. As such, it is one of the most useful and pertinent areas of study. So when I talk about learning science and science education, I am talking about a course of study that will result in a meaningful and deep understanding of how the natural and physical world works. And this is, I also think that science in, is tied with the craft of writing as being one of the best disciplines to help students learn how to learn, the process of how learning really happens. Uh, you, science isn't learned by just memorizing a collection of facts. Um, you might be able to do well on a test, but that's not really understanding how science works. So this is something, learning how to learn, to me, is really important to a good education. It's as important as the amount of knowledge. Because if you learn how to learn, you know how to teach yourself for the rest of your life. Um, I actually think science and the craft of writing are tied. So the, the principle of how you learn and how to build on what you learn, learning science, that is something that I'm going to talk about. I also think that this nurtures creativity and leads to a love of learning. And this is something that homeschooling parents really know. It, it, when we get it right, we end up with kids who absolutely love to learn. So if this seems like a lofty goal or too tall an order, well, I wanna, I'm going to give you some advice and I'm going to hold your hand for a bit and explain to you how it can be done. Now, some of you might not feel intimidated by learning science, but 
I do talk at other conferences and or I have, and people are really nervous about uh, science. They, they feel they're not good at it and or they don't have experience teaching it and they're worried. They're worried about how to do it. And so I have come up with really the five elements. But before I get into the five elements that make a good science education, I want to talk to you about the two distinct elements. Unfortunately, I use the same word. The two distinct parts to learning science. The first is to learn the facts and theories that form the foundation of science. So this first element might sound totally old school to you. Uh, you might even be wondering how this can be considered a part of a discussion about revolution and uh, revolutionizing education. But so first, I want to stop a minute and tell you that I think all homeschoolers are revolutionaries. We are revolutionizing education. But as far as science goes, the approach that I'm laying out will lead to a world-class science education, one that most students aren't getting. So anytime most people aren't being educated in a way and you're advocating that way, it's revolutionary. Uh, I actually hope that at some point the approach I'm talking about becomes traditional, not revolutionary. Uh, and it's why I am out talking about this. I want people to really begin to understand how the natural and physical world works. I think it would solve a lot of political <laughs> and environmental problems that our, that our kids face um, if they knew more science. Students need to learn the facts and theories that are central to the discipline of science. So when I say this, I'm not talking about arcane facts, theories, and information, things that could just be Googled, because you know that's what we all do these days. Um, and when somebody tells you a fact, half the time you Google it to see if you agree with them. I am talking about the basics of a science discipline. These are not things that can just be looked up without having any knowledge of them. For example, if you're going to study chemistry, you need to understand the basics of the atom and how the periodic table works. If you study biology, you need to know something about cell biology and genetics. So you can't, you have to have some foundation before you begin even knowing what to Google, what to look up. So the facts and theories that I'm talking about learning are the foundational fundamentals. This is a term I love and my publisher doesn't. <laughs> She's always taking it out. But these are the foundational fundamentals of the discipline. These fundamentals are important touch points to know where to go to get the information and un to understand how topics relate so students can apply the fundamentals using the process and practices that scientists use, which takes us to the second distinct element of learning science. So you learn how the facts and theories are applied to come to an understanding of how the natural and physical world works. The application of facts and theories, and this is where kids use science to learn how to learn. They use facts and theories that lead them to an understanding of the scientific method works, how scientific models are designed and how to interpret them, how data is collected and used, basically how scientists go about conducting science investigations that lead to a development of a better understanding of science. Um, this is one of the main reasons that the homeschool environment is so great for learning science. Traditional schools are not set up for the process of learning, of taking the time to learn and facilitating the learning of science in the way I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about an approach that focuses on a complete set of the foundational fundamentals and then applying those in a meaningful way. So this is the problem in traditional schools is there's a timeline on learning. And you cannot put a timeline on applying facts and theories. Um, so I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about. So at this time, I'm writing an Earth and Space text. Earth and Space is extremely process oriented. Um, it could, it, Earth and Space could just as easily be called applied chemistry and applied physics as Earth and Space. So it is a great science discipline to teach an understanding of how scientists have used science to develop theories uh, and models that help us all understand the world around us. 
So in the text, I have kids learn some of the facts and theories and then design their own models and working scientific theories based on their observations and knowledge. I have them use the facts they learn to develop a real scientist hypothesis, not the hypothesis that we teach kids in school as your best guess, you know, similar to, who do you think is going to text you next? And they're like, well, I don't know. I guess it's going to be, no. And we treat hypothesis that way. We treat when people are, kids are working with science, we treat it as if what the outcome of an experiment can be guessed at like that. So, so I have kids take a three weeks where they're learning various facts and uh, studying, looking at the geological processes that shape Earth. How do you identify, how can you identify these processes from looking at rocks and rock layers? So I have them do field work in that area. And then at the end of all that, I have them develop their hypothesis. So, so then, that's what scientists do. So now that you know all this stuff, what's your hypothesis for what happened in the area? And from that, I have them develop a working scientific theory for what happened. And that, through that, they are learning how science really works. Um, you know, and then I have them look at how people have come to understand what they, certain things, and then had to change the way they think. For example, why did people think the sun revolved around Earth? Well, we can memorize the fact that it doesn't, but why do you go out over the course of a day and figure out why people would ever think that? And then let's go back and look at um, the, the, the facts. So, so here's where practical observations can be misleading. So you discuss that. So it's important for kids then to work with the data to see how some of the observations fit one theory, the sun revolving around Earth, but all the observations fit another theory, the Earth revolving around the sun. So, so that the theory and the Earth moving through space. So that theory how do you come with the be up with the best working theory and decide to discard others? So from there, kids then design their own scientific model, sh showing them in a real practical way that Earth must be moving around the sun. This interaction creates what educators call ownership over the material. It's what real scientists practice in their field. It is the fun part. It is what we do when we homeschool science because we have the time and the space to do it. Learning the theory that scientists have come to understand is the best explanation, then getting up and applying that theory in a meaningful and practical way is engaging and fun. Why homeschooling science just rocks. Start early. Now I'm going to get into the first of the five elements. At the very end, there's a slide that recaps the five elements. Recently, I love this story. I can't, it's so serendipitous that it happened to me, but uh, I will talk to anybody, anytime, anywhere. It's my personality. Recently, I volunteered at the Intel ISEF Science Fair. Uh, actually, it's the International Science and Education Fair, so it's kind of redundant for me to call also end it with Science Fair. It is a huge international science fair. They don't actually consider it a science fair. They consider it a science talent search, and I love it, with thousands of high school students across the globe competing for a total of about $4 million in prize money. At lunchtime, I happened to sit down with six female scientists. I made a point of sitting at a table where I didn't know anybody. <laughs> Three of them were or had been high school science teachers. One was a college professor who taught teachers how to teach science, and two worked for a, an aquarium in the Long Beach area. We all got to talking about what we did or had done, and of course, they wanted to know what I did. And when it came to homeschooling science, um, they were really excited. Now, you might think that this group would not be a proponent of homeschooling. I certainly did. When they wanted to know what I did, I backtracked a little and said it kind of quietly. And I was totally wrong. These women had been to many science fairs as volunteers and with their students and um, or as judges. And what they saw again and again was that often the best science fair projects were from homeschooling students. 
The homeschool students were often who won the science fairs too. So I was curious to find out why they thought homeschool kids were winning these science fairs. What were they doing that, that was superior? And they said to me that the problem is when traditional schools begin teaching science. According to them, science is being taught later and later in school. That's because of the current state with education, because of testing and how schools get funding. Schools pour time and money into language arts and math because if those test scores are low, then their funding is cut. I mean, you, you, you can see how that can happen. So teachers focus their energy and resources on math and language arts to the detriment of science. And often, if kids are lucky enough to get science before high school, it's as a component of language arts. It isn't science for the sake of science. It does the, my point one of the two parts to, uh, to um, uh, elements of science, but not the point two part. Um, it's not about doing science. Ah, there's a big difference. Reading science versus doing science. It's why a lot of adults hate science and think it's boring. So what happens when you don't start science until high school? Is that you come out of high school, you come into high school science, weak in science, and science, teach, science teachers have to start teaching at a much more basic level. This is what these women told me. This isn't, so they were teaching in years past, they could start at a more advanced level. Serious subjects are taught beginning in grade school. Why isn't the subject that teaches how the natural and physical world works serious enough to start teaching early? And, and I hear from people all the time that they can wait to teach science. The kids are not ready. I, boy, when I hear that, I often think the teachers and parents aren't ready, but their kids are. I totally do not understand the logic. I, as I've said, like about so many times, it explains how the natural and physical world works. Why isn't grade school the perfect time to start teaching that? And it's really sad because kids are interested in plants, butterflies, stars, planets, cooking, how it works. They are fascinated by it, but, but I don't think parents are fascinated by it. Or we worry so much about following the methodologies that schools lay down. Well, they don't teach science, so why should we? Remember, we are revolutionizing education. I don't get, I don't discard every element uh, from traditional school. I'm a centrist. I'm not an unschooler and I'm not a classical educator. I use every single methodology I can think of that works. I'm a, ch I'm a cherry picker of, method of teaching methodologies. Uh, and, then, and what I use depends on the subject and uh, how my child is accessing that subject. So when we start early, it allows for more depth and complexity of a person's understanding about how the natural and physical world works, about science. There's a certain amount of knowledge that you begin to anticipate and expect that students are going to have. I want to use language as an example. So we, in our house, we have learned Russian because they have a Ukrainian daughter-in-law and we have been to the Ukraine. And it made the Ukrainians speak Russian and Ukraine. Uh, this was a long time ago when it wasn't, now I wouldn't, don't know if I'd speak Russian in <laughs> no, Ukraine. But, um, and we know Hindi. Uh, we absolutely loved India and so we really spent a lot of time in the last couple of years on Hindi. So if I were in a restaurant and somebody started speaking Ukrainian, which I don't know, I would tune them out. If they started speaking Hindi, I would listen to them. I might even be, with my personality, I would probably talk to them a little. Uh, I would engage with them. Now, I don't speak Hindi well. Uh, I couldn't have a real full-on conversation. I would have to hope that they also spoke English. But I, it would change my interaction. It would change how I'm accessing, unfortunately, the conversation I'm hearing next to me. But if and science is just like that. I um, tutor friends sometimes in math and uh, friends' kids in math and um, science. And when I tutor kids in math, I often find that um, 
uh, they have the complicated topics of being introduced, but there's a hole somewhere in the back. And so because they haven't addressed that hole in their knowledge, things are just going right over their head. And if we go and fill in that one hole, then they begin to be able to access it. Science is no different. I've tutored somebody one year in Byte Middle School Biology, and, and he was having so much trouble with the chapter, and it was dealing with the polarity of water. It was biology, and I said, well, do you know any chemistry? No, because they taught biology before chemistry in this school. And um, well, did they explain about polarity or electronegativity? No. So what was happening? This person had no way to access the information. He couldn't access the more deep and complicated under, uh, knowledge. So starting early. The second element that I want to talk to you today about is a focus on the fundamentals. This, to me, is really a problem when there is not a focus on the fundamentals. It is important to understand the underlying principles that are the root knowledge required for a more advanced understanding of a subject. This goes right back to what I was saying about water and polarity, and, and it doesn't help to introduce those topics without an understanding of the root knowledge of the, some of the basics of chemistry. I am there is a certain, there are certain fundamental principles that are the basic building blocks for understanding science concepts. For instance, atoms. All matter is made of atoms. Every single science principle where we explain how the natural and physical world works at its very core is talking about atoms. Even a graduate student studying complicated science principles and theories must know, has to know about atoms. It is a foundational, fundamental principle of all of science, and it's necessary to understand much, almost any science information relates to it. So if you don't focus on the fundamentals, at least to two problems. The first is that the student's knowledge base is not complete, and the second is that concepts are just too complicated. Uh, there, the scientific method. You might think that the fundamentals are a list to memorize. But in fact, in science, the fundamentals have as much to do about application and learning how to apply them as it does to learning facts. Fundamentals include the basic methods used to apply those facts and the processes and procedures to implement them and to design experiments models, and scientific theories around them. This is the get up and doing part, and it should make up most of any science. It's also, for parents, the most work. <laughs> I know, I homeschool my child. <laughs> Some days you feel like putting in that time and energy more than others. The scientific method is an important aspect of learning science, is learning how to use this. Learning how to use it does not mean memorizing the basic components of it so you can write a lab report. The absolute best way to learn the scientific method is through applying it. It's based on experimentation, experiment. It's based on observations, make observations, not just within the scope of experimenting, and this is why it's so great with homeschooling when parents understand what children are learning because you understand that you can make observations all around you when you're learning about how the natural and physical world works. And deductive reasoning. I often wonder why math is where logic is taught. It seems like this logic should be a key component of science. It really should be. There is time in home, there is time to tease out the answers to the questions. This is just not something you can set a timeline on. Schools, by their very nature, it seems like I'm bashing schools, but again, I'm not. But by their very nature, they're forced to have an artificial amount of time that students can learn science concepts. At home, at my home, I like to say that I teach my son a page width. I try to teach him a page width or have him learning a page width above um, where he is at. Sometimes the pages add up quickly and sometimes they don't. But it doesn't really matter, does it? It's about acquiring knowledge not about the amount of time it took to acquire it. A good foundation leads to a better ability to analyze data. 
models, and theories to learn new concepts and to see how the various pieces relate. This, the, the, in the, this lack of a good foundation to me is how the politicization of science has occurred. It's a, I know friends who are scientists who weigh in on both sides of many debates, but most people have to believe the scientists they want to believe because they don't know enough to tease the answers that, that out themselves. Uh, when this has to do with your own health, to me that's scary, but I'm a scientist. I like to figure the answers out on my own. Single subject, this is the third of the five elements. On the face of it, learning things as a single subject might sound like, it might sound like spending an entire year every four years creates artificial boundaries between science knowledge. Now it is important that you choose material to use, that, um, that to teach, that points out and makes connections um, uh, between the different disciplines. But, but to learn the single subjects, because you learn the basics, a lot creates a cohesive body of knowledge and actually makes it easier to make connections. <sighs> Often, science is taught as a grab bag approach. I call it the smattering approach, which is actually derogatory, just in case it sounds like it, it is. When my sister, whose son goes to a traditional school, was telling her principal about uh, the fact that I write single science textbooks, and it was one of the reasons she chose that school, because they teach science in single subject throughout the year. The teacher, the, the principal said yes, because instead of a jack of, because if you don't, it creates a jack of all trades, master of none approach. So I liked it so well, I put it in there. I know it's not an original quote from her or myself, but I still, it fits. So when I told the gal at the ISEF conference that I was not a fan of the smattering approach, they said that in the past they would agree with me. But that now, in the states, the state of science being taught was so shabby that they would even like it if people went back to the smattering approach. So it turns out that the smattering approach for learning science is better than none at all. <laughs> so if it is between the smattering approach and none at all, go for the smattering approach. Otherwise, you're much better off uh, having your children learn it as a single discipline. Just as we have every, just as we have them learn every other academic discipline that we care about. Mastery of each science discipline is superior for each discipline and for making connections across the discipline. It allows for a more in-depth understanding of the foundational fundamentals. So it's sort of the point I was making at the beginning of this slide, but I want to make it again. This really goes back to teaching the foundational fundamentals. You start to build on concepts, creating a firm foundation. If any of you have watched a house being built or had your children build structures with Legos, put that picture in your head right now, especially with light, well, with houses too, but with Legos. If it's weak, it's not going to stay up. Once you have a firm foundation, you can add more and more complicated material on top of that foundation. Anybody who has worked with their children at math knows exactly what I'm talking about. Honestly, there's no other subject that we do not, that we take seriously, that we do not teach as a single subject. And there is a reason for that. Revolutionary, in this day and age, yes. I, it might be old school, but it's not used anymore. The fourth element of a good science education is a good textbook or reference material. OK, now, so choose texts that are comprehensive, that do not skip over the basics, introducing advanced topics and language that before they focus on the fundamentals. I'm not going to go over that. Uh, I've already spoken enough to that point. So I write science textbooks that are very complete. They're not fluffy. Uh, they're fun to write. Uh, they're fun to read. I write to the kids. I hear all the time that kids uh, find them engaging and even silly sometimes. 
but the science in them is really serious. I don't, I personally don't think science needs to be extremely complicated to be understood. Uh, so as, as a result, when I used to teach at community college, my classes were full. Too many people try to make science way, too many scientists try to make science way too complicated. I am, so, so anyway, I write curriculum. Uh, it shouldn't surprise anyone that I am a fan of having some sort of guide and guidance to follow for each subject that I'm having my child study over the course of a year. This doesn't just apply to science, by the way. Am I biased toward using curriculum? Yes. But it doesn't mean I'm wrong. <laughs> I am an experienced teacher, and this is the voice of experience talking. Every area of science has a lot of information in it. Uh, every area that your child is learning actually has a lot of information in it. It helps to have a guide. Someone who is an expert in that field help you figure out the scope and sequence of the material to cover. There is just no way to teach the foundational fundamentals in science as a year-long single subject without a textbook. I don't think even over any timeline without some sort of guide. Make it a good one. Choose somebody you respect. Every science class that I have ever taught, I have been handed a stack of textbooks. You should see, I have, a, I have, I'm not very good at throwing this kind of thing away. I have stacks of textbooks. Uh, I was handed the teacher's textbook, the lab manual, the answer key, test making software, a copy of the student's textbook in case the teacher's textbook wasn't enough. This, te these textbooks were chosen by a committee of people of, of, of when it was chemistry, chemists, biology, biologists at the community college who were tenured. And they were, excuse me, <coughs> so they decided that that was what the course was going to look like that year. Now, this might sound really limiting, but I did not find it to be limiting at all. I used it as a guide. I did not teach directly from it. Uh, I would add to it, but I taught closely to it because I wanted students to have something that they could refer to when I wasn't there. So, so sometimes I would use the curriculum as a touch point, and it depended on my class. Some years I would have, uh, when you teach chemistry, you get a lot of nursing students um, who, uh, especially at community college, you get women who are returning. I used to feel for these women, they have a couple kids, and it's going to change their life if they can get a nursing degree. And many of them really struggle with chemistry. You get kids fresh out of high school, um, and then you get uh, people who were, had been in the service and were returning. And some people were phenomenal at chemistry and some people struggled. And you would, I would gear the level of my teaching for, for the students that I had. So sometimes I would stick to the text more closely. And sometimes I would use it as a touch point to either go higher in level or, or slightly more basic. So it is essential to have a guide somewhere for the students and myself to reference um, to make sure that all, and for me to make sure I cover all of the material. The curriculum we use, by the way, is not always a textbook. In history, I love Coursera. I love it. There's some absolutely phenomenal history uh, courses. There's actually some good uh, science courses on there as well, um, but I haven't used those. Science is a little different than history, though, because you're going to need labs. And you're going to need lab sheets with material lists. Um, and so it really, it's not that easy to teach science without some sort of uh, textbook, uh, or at least lab manual, so that um, students have it and so that they can refer to it. Different students access information differently. That's what I'm talking about right here. Uh, science is lucky in that it is best taught with reading, listening, watching, and getting up and moving around, interacting with the information. Other subjects are much more work to figure out strategies for accessing all the learning modalities. I'm a big one for having kids access um, the information in every way possible. I have noticed, I taught a co-op class um, this last year, and I really got to see 
how different kids um, access information differently. Uh, some kids would come into, so I would have kids learn about the theory and then come, it was a lab class. We met once a week to do the labs. And I would see some kids come in and they really, they already knew the information that they were applying to the labs. And some kids couldn't figure it out until they um, use their hands to figure it out. My son actually is one of those people that does best when he manipulates the data. It has made math um, something, some work to teach him uh, the more advanced concepts. So I honestly, based on my experience, would not have my son take a science co-op where there wasn't a textbook so that he could refer back to it after he had accessed the information, both before and after. Because um, if the subject gets complicated, both the student and the parent the, or the instructor need something to refer to. Um, the internet I love, but it's patchy. And in science, you have to be very careful. Uh, I teach secular science specifically, and so you have to be um, careful where your homeschooling resources come from. Uh, I also think it's important for students to have something that they can hold in their hands, underline, highlight, um, take ownership of, make notes all over. Uh, you should see my textbooks from college. So the fifth element, uh, we are making good time. We're going to have about 15 minutes for questions. Carefully paired theory with labs and activities. This is uh, really, really important. All theories and no labs. Uh. So before I begin, I hate that, what a bore. Let's be clear what I'm talking about when I call something a good science course. I am talking about a science course where students get up and move around where they get their hands dirty. They're going to make a mess of your kitchen some days. I am talking about foundational fundamentals and using all the learning modalities and applying them to real world labs and activities that someone has taken the time to carefully relate to the theory and that makes sense with that theory. That's another reason that you want a good curriculum, somebody, a good guide, somebody who's already gone through and made sure that the um, labs pair well with the theory. When I say theory, I mean the written text. This is where science becomes fun. When scientific theories are paired well with labs and activities, it enhances an understanding of the scientific method and science learning. It demonstrates through use and practice how hypotheses are formed, conclusions determined based on the facts that students are studying or that they already know. Um, and you also use data from lab work. You hear people toss around all the time the term uh, in the newspaper, well, the data, the data. I have a master's in physical chemistry. It was a lot of data crunching in that lab. And when people talk to me about the data, I shut them down. I understand the problems with data, but most people, but, but the data, um, yes, you can put in a wrong number, but most of the people I know who are dealing with data are very thoughtful and careful and pretty meticulous about um, the numbers. Sometimes I see science being taught where it is all theory with no labs or activities. Other times I see science being taught with all labs and activities, but no theory. Neither is adequate. So. Um, at the very end, I want to take a poll, uh, but I want you to think of the answer now. The reason we have to wait till the end is I am easily distracted, um, and I could get distracted if you all start answering now, but I want you right now to tell me if you have ever, or to tell me at the end, have you ever had a good science class? So when I give this talk to conferences, if there's 50 people in the audience, at most five will raise their hands. Uh, and, ev and every single one that raises their hands had a teacher that taught theory with labs. Nobody ever, every once in a while somebody just had a lab class. Nobody ever raises their hand if they just learned the theory. And uh, that is why, that is, I think all theory and no labs is where science gets a bad name. <laughs>
<laughs> it's as parents, the labs and activities are work, guys. Really, honestly, I want to stress that. I hear it all the time. I write for, um, a, I'm not the only author for this series that I write for. They have a lot of labs in them. And, and it's the one thing you'll hear people say, oh, I don't want to use their course. There's so many labs. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, but your kids aren't getting a good science education if they don't get those labs. <laughs> I'm going on record right now. Public, publish it everywhere. That is what I'm going to tell you. Uh, if all labs and no theory is just as bad, it's not as boring, but it's just as bad. I like to say, you know what, if you're going to do all labs and no theories, let your child learn to cook. Teach the science behind it. At least at the end of that, they will have a skill. You're not learning the foundational fundamentals if you just do the labs with no theories. It's actually how I be, ended up writing uh, my first science course. A friend of mine's daughter who homeschools her daughter, she's a year uh, of older than, or, or in a, I hate to use grade with homeschoolers, but as a placeholder, she will leave home to go to college a year before my son will be done with his home education. Uh, and I asked her what third grade chemistry looked like, and she said, well, there's no text. There's just books of experiments. And I started rattling off to her how you would design a uh, the theory that needed to be taught. And she said, well, you know, that's really great because for you to tell me because you're a chemistry professor, but what about the rest of us? And so I started writing a booklet for her uh, daughter and my son to use, and it became a science course. Uh, you have to have the theory with the labs. Um, in order for it to be called science, uh, so you, you need all of those things. You need an understanding. So let's take baking a cake. I love this analogy. So when you bake a cake, your purpose is to make a yummy treat. But to understand the chemistry or, and biology and physics that went into baking that cake, that's, it's actually some pretty in-depth science that goes into the whole cake baking process. So to understand all of that, you're, you're going to need to know the theory, how it all ties together. When this is done, when there is a careful pairing of theory with labs and activities, no place outside of a college lab that is paired with a lecture course, that is well paired with a lecture course, which colleges aren't always great at doing can match the homeschooling community. It is one of the reasons I think that we are winning all those science fairs. OK, here are the five steps to a great science education. Then I want to hear any questions from any of you. I hope that this helps any of you who are worried about your child, children learning science. I hope it doesn't sound too complicated. I want to close with science is so much fun. I hope you take the time to explore science with your children. Now, I, you might wonder if I come from a science, heavy duty science background, and the answer is no. My family, uh, about four years ago, we were at dinner with my family, and one of my aunts said, why science? And before I could answer, my husband said, she was a science professor. She writes science textbooks. What do you mean, why science? I absolutely love understanding how the natural and physical world works. It is very holistic to me. Um, and I get a, I, I love just the discipline of this whole learning knowledge and then applying it. And I hope you explore it with your kids so that they will know too. OK. Hi. Um, I'm Blair. A lot of you joined uh, that we all didn't say hi. Um, OK, can you pin this link to Pinterest? You absolutely can pin it. Please share not just my talks, but this whole conference. Uh, the, um, uh, I love the fact that we can all download this. I listen to three of the keynotes, and I listen to them as taped. Uh, I wanted to see how that worked. It was just really awesome. Uh, Biochem in 10th grade. 
fantastic. Oh, your kitchen is already a mess, Lisa. I know. Isn't it crazy? Uh, we you, we work with the slide a lot um, with microscopes, and um, a lot of my clothes have blue stain all over them. So does anybody have a question? Type it. Ask me. Have I? Um, Lisa, do we need to enable anything? Um, no, actually, we don't. Uh, we have audio and video enabled for everyone. Usually what you do, is, and I'll do it right now, is you would raise your hand. And if you would raise your hand, why is it not doing it? There we go. Do you hear the little ding on the little one? If everybody raised their hand, we'd have we'd all be queued up, the English say. We'd be in order. And then we'd let you go one at a time. That's what you do when you have a class. But with uh, adults, we don't usually have to do that. OK. No questions. Um, are all of you homeschooling? I'm no not. Question. I'm You're probably not. the only one here who is not. Oh, OK. So has anyone had a great uh, science class. No. <laughs> well, I did. I'll, I'll tell you my little story. Yeah, I was biochem in 10th grade. And it was so good because we had both theory and we had labs. Our teacher was called Dusty. I'm sure it's a real name. But that's what we called them. And we had to dissect beetle pigs. And getting past the gross part of the formaldehyde, we took out the, the um, intestines, and uh, we played jump rope. And of course, I was with the guys, and all the girls were screaming. I think that was my best experience. Is that terrible? Um, well, uh, no, not if you like dissecting. Um, when I uh, had my co-op class dissect, um, we had people becoming nauseous and fainting. Only one person made it to the end. Um, uh, and by the end, I was nauseous from all, you know how when everybody starts to get nauseous, you start to get nauseous? Well, it was a rough uh, lab. Um, Well, OK. So uh, you know what? I, uh, uh, is it is Piyush or Maru? So your daughter's in first grade. What is she studying? If you would like to take the microphone, if you have a mic or headset, you click the word talk, and then you just start yapping away. And sometimes people don't have microphones. That's OK, too. Um, you and I, according to me, are the only ones that have microphones. And um, I, mine is recent, actually, uh, because I um, have be uh, my carpal tunnel got so bad, I had to <laughs> start using Dragon software, which introduces some very strange typos. Uh, so let me see. Oh, Lisa was raised by a doctor. So lots of great science. Uh, Sabrina had, is having trouble with her cell phone. Oh, bummer. Uh, oh, you see, you answered a whole bunch of great questions. OK. Puerto Rico, Sabrina left from Puerto Rico, Anaheim, La Mirada. Awesome. Well, uh, I hope you guys check out other people's, um, I'm assuming everybody here is a homeschooler. 
Uh, and um, there is, like I said, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, um, email me. Uh, they might uh, end up in my blog. Um, Uh, we might get into a conversation that leads to a blog post that happens sometimes. Um, thank you, Piyush. Uh, and um, I should we end the session, or uh, Lisa, or um, uh, yes, we can do that. Email. And I would like to offer you applause. Go to the smiley face. Drop down menu, three down applause. Virtually, I'm applauding because this was just wonderful. I'm always surprised when I volunteer to do these things, and somehow Steve gets me into these things where he knows I'm going to like the topic. Oh, awesome! I was really excited to when I looked at the venue. Um, and I just want. Everybody who's here, I hope I inspired you. If you're not inspired to really facilitate the education of science for your child, I hope I inspired you to do that. I hope you share this with people so that they become inspired to do it. That is where I want to see the revolution. I really passionately want there to be a revolution where kids learn science, where we make it where we make it so that it is accessible and we teach it, do a better job of teaching it, of facilitating the learning of it. I, I really, really hope that. Uh, and that is why I, I do this. <laughs> and Lisa, you're awesome. I'm going to help moderate a session tomorrow. I hope I do as well as you.